A couple of semesters ago, I made this demonstration with Lillian Lin, a student in Introduction to Robotics. And what it tries to do is demonstrate all the things that we learn in the first four chapters of Intro to Robotics. So what we have here is we've got a two-link robot arm, one link and the second link, and the first thing we can talk about is forward kinematics. So forward kinematics, if I tell you what the angles are of the robot joints, then that tells you where the whole robot is. We know where every point in this robot is just by knowing what are the two links parameters here. I've shown a few extra things that are kind of interesting here. This blue space is the reachable workspace of the robot. As it moves around, it can never leave this disk. Interesting things happen if you don't make these robot links the same length. If I make the first length a little bit shorter, See, it's, it's much shorter than the other. Now this whole spot in the in center is unreachable. So we can move around, and there's, there's no way that you can bend, and actually you, it's kind of like the spot in the back of your, in your back that you can't scratch. There's no way to reach that point. And the interesting thing is that we get this even if we make the first link longer. You know, so if, either, if they're just not the same size, then you're going to have this region that is unreachable. So this we'll learn is actually an evidence of a singularity, a singular position in here. That is our forward kinematics. You tell us what the angles are, and then we know where the end of the robot is. Inverse kinematics says, well, I want to drag this ending point of the robot somewhere, and you tell me what are the angles. So you can see that these angles are adjusting to get that end effector right where I drag it. Uh, no matter where I get it, I get that. However, there's something interesting about a two-link robot, and that is that there's always two solutions in the interior of this workspace. There's the elbow up. See how that elbow is cocked upwards, or the elbow can be down. So those are the two solutions. The only places where you don't have two solutions are on the edge of this reachable workspace, and again, that's because these are singular positions. There is no elbow up, elbow down. They're exactly the same solution when you're here. And then if I come in here, however, Again, there's no elbow up and no elbow down, because there's only a way I can do that is by locking this position. There's only one solution there on the boundary of my workspace. Those correspond with singularities. The next thing that we can do is we can talk about how fast I move these joints. So for any configuration that I am, I can choose how fast should I move theta 1 and theta 2. And so right here, theta 1, I can make it either negative, or I can make it positive. So I'm going to keep theta 2 dot 0, but theta 1 is going to, if it's positive, then I'm going to be torquing this. See how this arrow is towards the right there? I can make it bigger or smaller. This is as big as I can get it. And so when I'm in this configuration, I move, that's going to cause an acceleration in this direction. However, the accelerations that I get by moving my different robots depend on where I'm at. So if I apply the same joint velocity, but I move my robot over here, so now my robot's over here. I'm going to, again, apply all theta 1. Now I get a velocity that's in a different direction. It's actually the opposite direction of what we had. So you have to recalculate your Jacobian for every position you are in order to figure out how your motors are going to correspond to how fast the end effector goes. Now if I go in the negative direction, then I'm going to go back in that direction. If I have 0, for th I'm not moving my first joint at all. I'm just moving my second joint. Then I can move that, you see, as a positive thing, I'll pull this inwards, whereas a negative one is going to make it flip outwards. And so I can generate velocities in there. And so that's what this ellipse is. This is called the manipulability ellipse. And what it tells you is what are the instantaneous velocities that I can achieve. If I say that I'm only going to hold my theta one dot and my theta two dot inside this bounded unit ball. That means the sum of the squares is always less than 1. So that gives me my circular region here. Then I'm going to get another region over here that's going to look like an ellipse. And you see as I move around this boundary, I move around the boundary of that ellipse. This is found by taking the time derivatives of your forward kinematics equations. Now we can also do inverse velocity where you say, well, I'd really like to move my end effector in this direction. And then we can solve for how we should move those motors in order to do that. Now when I get into a singular configuration, 
Now this ellipse that I have, it goes into a degenerate case, so it flattens into a line. Now the only velocities I can do are along this line. And so any input that you put in here is only going to get generate instantaneous velocities that are straight out in that direction. And you can think about that. Take your arm and then hold it straight out. And now if you move your shoulder and you move your elbow, you're only moving your, your thumb up and down. Uh, you can't bring it in towards yourself instantaneously. So we, what we've got is forward kinematics. I'm moving here. Let me get out of that singular configuration. We've got our workspace. We've got our inverse kinematics as we move this around here. We've got our forward velocity kinematics. And we've got our inverse velocity kinematics. And we've got a few things that show us and allow us to explore what the singular configurations are. So delightful thing. Big thanks to Lillian Lin for making this possible. Have a great day.